I am the world's luckiest man. Let me explain. A quick story about me. So I grew up in a low income, first generation household where my family was the first family out of our entire family tree to come to the States in hopes that my brother and I would have a shot at the American dream. But part of my immigrant family story is that we actually struggled financially and grew up in an environment where we thought about money a lot. I remember waking up in the middle of the night when I was in third grade and my parents were going back and forth as to whether or not they should move back to the States. But they concluded by saying, you know what, we're going to try for me and my brother's sake in hopes that we can achieve that American dream. In high school, my parents would always push this idea that college was the most important thing that I had to worry about. Again, I was lucky. I got involved with the wrong crowd and I was involved in a bad situation where we were all shoplifting as a group and we were caught. This taught me a super important lesson very earlier on in my career that I'm a bad thief, <laughs> but also that things don't come easy. You can't find shortcuts in a lot of ways to really anything. You have to get, if you want something, then you have to work hard. And that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned in that so early on in my adolescent years. Fast forward to college. It was the first time I had gone further east than Utah. I was born in Korea, came to California, pretty much spent my entire adult life up until that point before I moved over to Boston. And before I left to Boston, I remember how hard my parents struggled for them to have gathered enough money to pack all my suitcases, buy me a flight, one-way flight to Boston and said, Jerry, we'll see you during winter break. It was probably one of the riskiest investments that they could have made, but they made that investment into me. And at the airport at 5 a.m. that day, I told them, mom, dad, from this point on, I am going to be financially independent from you all. And if anything, if I have the opportunity to, I'm going to send you money and I'm going to make sure I keep you all happy and most importantly, feel like your investment in me was worth it. I remember they scoffed at me. They said, listen, Jerry, that's not your job. Just get a job, right? Come college. I remember I had applied to about 10 on-campus jobs. And these were work-study opportunities available for people like me who really needed the money to survive in college. And I remember I'd applied to about 10 places and one of those 10 places finally got back to me. The other nine rejected me. And that one place was a school facility named Phonathon. At Phonathon, we were the kids who were calling our alumni for donations. So if you've graduated from a U.S. college, you know exactly what I mean. Those pesky callers. I got super lucky. At that point, I had no idea how to wear a suit. I had no idea how to write a resume, but they had taken me in. And I had finally had a way for me to earn income. But one thing I began to realize was that at the end of every month, I had almost next to nothing, despite me actually having income. And so I thought to myself, what any logical person would think, cool, I just need to work more hours. So I later found three more on-campus jobs. So in total, I was working about 20 hours a week. And still, I ran into that same problem. I was close to almost nothing at the end of each month. And I was thinking there has to be a better way. At this point, I began to think, what if I don't have to work in school? What if I could work outside of school in hopes that I can maybe get paid a little bit more? 
So during my second year of college, I had this realization and I had finally got my first real internship where I was paid $20 an hour. This was almost two times more than what I was getting paid and I could not fathom that idea. How? I was lucky. And so I remember I went into the internship. I had learned a ton, but it had set a strong foundation for me for me to find other internships moving forward. And that was the second semester of my sophomore year. That sophomore summer, I had interned at a company called EMC where I was earning about $23 an hour and I was working 40 hours a week. And I was at this point feeling so happy and I was saying, you know what? I'm gonna continue this momentum when I start college again back for my third year. That fall semester, I'd interned and I started making about 25 an hour. That spring, I started working and I made roughly about the same. And that fall, and that following summer was when I had my first break in my career and I became the first intern at Google from my school. And a lot of people ask me this question, Jerry, how'd you do it? And oftentimes I'm sort of left with this look on my face of, I got lucky. I tossed in my application. I did not network. I didn't know anyone who worked at Google. I only dreamt that this would be a destination five years from now, but it happened. And as soon as I graduated, I came back onto campus and I had started my senior year internship at a tech company called Rapid7 where they taught me everything I needed to know from a technical skills perspective, but also just working with leaders. And before I started my full-time job at Google, I had about three years of working experience compared to zero to, the, to my peers of zero years of experience. How did this happen? I got lucky. I was put in a situation where I had to work, not because I wanted to, but because I truly had to. So as soon as I started my full-time role at Google, I was one of the youngest analysts by far. I mean, we're talking the next person closest to my age was maybe about four or five years older than I was. And whenever I walked into the meetings, I could immediately feel the eyes on me saying, wow, there is a college graduate sitting here. He must know nothing, or at least that's what I thought. But what this did for me was this set the expectation of what I was expected to deliver at rock bottom. I remember my manager telling me, Jerry, why don't you spend the first month to explore all the cafes, do all the things that a new Googler should do? Don't worry about work. And at the time I was like, yes, of course I'm gonna take advantage of the situation. You're telling me that I can get paid by just simply eating? That's the dream. And so I remember after month one, I had gone to about 20 different cafes. I met up with my friends. I ended work around 3 or 4 p.m. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a, this is a dream. But after a month, I began to realize I'm getting bored. There really isn't much else for me to do apart from me to explore cafes. And so that's when I approached my manager again. I said, listen, I'm getting bored. I want to start doing projects. I started talking to more people and my manager offhandedly said, you know what, why don't you do an analysis? Help us identify trends at a global level. And at the time, I was thinking, cool, I can do it. But I was thinking, man, what, what does this even mean? What's gonna be my end output? And so I remember starting the project, I was pumping out queries, and there was this one number that just looked off. There was a spike in the numbers and I sh was showing all my colleagues and my peers saying, hey, listen, look at this number here. I don't think this is a good thing. And everyone told me, Jerry, you should absolutely look into this. What happened was I actually found one of the biggest product loopholes our org of 10 years had ever found. I had led a team of two product managers, four engineers, a team of legal, uh, of product of product lawyers, two other analysts, this 
actually got me an award from our vice president indicating that, hey, Jerry, this project had one of the biggest impact for that year. And as a result, seven months into my career, I got a call and a meeting with my manager saying, hey, you're going to be promoted next month. And I cannot believe my ears. I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I'm going to get promoted on my first performance review. And at the time I was thinking, I didn't do anything crazy, right? I just did sort of what you told me to. But again, how did this happen? I got lucky. Shortly after my promotion, I realized that, hey, this actually isn't my passion area. I don't want to keep growing in the analytics data science space. So I began to look elsewhere. What other teams are there? And what really fascinated me at the time was business strategy within the tech company. And so I applied to a number of roles. Almost every single role required two, four, six years of consulting experience and the MBA, none of which I had. At that point, all I had was one year of working experience and a promotion under my belt. I remember I interviewed for this team and I was feeling confident. I was saying, hey, I know the answers to all these questions. And more importantly, he said, hey, I remember the interviewer asked me, what is your biggest accomplishment? And I remember telling him I got promoted my first performance cycle. And he said, what do you think that's attributed to? I said, hey, listen, it's a little bit of luck, but I think it's some of my hard work. And then he looked at me and said, or it could have been that you were brought in at the wrong level. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am going to completely bomb this interview. He's absolutely right. That could be something. What happened was actually I had gotten that role and I was actually one of the youngest people, again, to be in that organization by about roughly five years. But the only difference was that everyone around me were from Bain and Company, McKinsey and Company, Boston Consulting Group, or they graduated from top MBA schools like MIT Sloan, Harvard Business School, and Stanford. And I was looking around going, I am completely out of my league. And I remember when I joined the team, there was only one other person who was my manager at the time. And we were trying to figure out how should we, between the two of us, do five people's worth of work because there were a lot of work to be done. My director's solution to this problem was we were going to borrow someone from another team who's a little bit more senior to step into our team and help us out with the work for about six months. What happened was our president was asking us a ton of questions about the business and we had to answer them. This person who was senior brought onto our team, unfortunately had a medical incident where she had to take a leave of absence. And so this left a huge gap on our team. My manager looked around and said, Jerry, you're up. You're the only person I got left. And I said, cool, I'll try. And what had happened was that those next four months were the hardest I've ever worked, but most importantly, there were one of the biggest pivotal moments in my career where I felt like I learned so much. I almost felt like I went through business school simply by working so closely with my manager and he was working with me almost on a daily basis. But we delivered a presentation and I remember sitting in the room, sitting right next to the president and the pre within the first five minutes of this hour long presentation, our president looked at us and said, Jerry, Ankit, okay. what would you do if I told you that I agree to everything that you have written on this presentation? I was looking at myself going, oh my gosh, I have no idea what to say. And my manager said, great. And he started pivoting into a new topic. What had happened at that moment was that project set the foundation for my relationship with my manager, the, but also more importantly, my learning and how I problem solve. It taught me his way of thinking and I loved it. During my second performance review, I had been promoted. My manager came running, to, rushing to me and saying, hey, Jerry, I need to talk to you. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, what happened? And he came to me and said, hey, I got you promoted. Congratulations. And I could not believe my ears for a second time. In my first year and a half of working at Google, I had been promoted twice. And in the second team, how did that happen? If it weren't for that teammate who, if it weren't for me joining 
the team early on where they had a desperate need to hire people, I wouldn't have been part of the team. If it weren't for that person going on medical leave, then I wouldn't have had the opportunity for me to step up. It was those two moments where I got really lucky and had those opportunities, I took advantage of it. And I said, hey, listen, I'm your guy and I'll try to make it happen. And luckily it did. Now at this point, you might be wondering, Jerry, how can I replicate your success? How can I also get promoted twice in my first year and a half? And I could tell you how hard I work. I could tell you everything that I did right. But truth be told, I got lucky. In each and every single one of these situations, if the right blocks weren't in place, one thing would have not led to the other. And it simply just wouldn't have netted me to where I am today. So what, did, what have I learned then? It, what I've learned is that everyone has their opportunities for them to be lucky in their career. It's a matter of whether or not you as an individual, as a professional, are gonna take those lucky opportunities and make action behind them. If your manager leaves and your director asks you to step up, if your teammate leaves and you're asked to take on additional projects, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna say, hey, listen, this is not within my job description, I'm not gonna do it? Or are you gonna step up to the plate and say, yes, I'm gonna do what I can and try to make sure I put the team on my back? I attribute a lot of my success, not because of hard work, not because of hard work, but because I truly am one of the luckiest people alive here. Thank you so much for coming here to my talk today, and I hope to see you all soon.